Um, good afternoon. My name is Wafa Fatizadeh, and I am delighted to welcome all of you on behalf of the Justice for Journalists Foundation, an NGO established in the UK with an ultimate goal of providing support to the investigations of crimes against media professionals. Even though we primarily focus on violent crimes against journalists, we cannot overlook another alarming trend. Journalists investigating corruption, being threatened or charged with defamation of libel, violation of privacy, or even support of terrorism. These legal actions often possess characteristics of slaps, strategic litigation against public participation. As one of very few donors giving support to the projects focusing on slaps, we're dedicated to exploring this practice. Last year, we committed about $200,000 to support several Western European and Latin American organizations studying SLAPS. Among them is the Foreign Policy Center in the UK. This year, we're planning to expand the geography of our anti-SLAP projects to the Middle East, Central Asia, and Eastern Europe. Our projects analyze trends and striking similarities in methods employed by the authoritarian governments. Our partners also look into connection between those in the mentioned regimes launching legal attacks on journalists on the one hand and the legal professionals in the advanced democracies providing services to these slap initiators on the other. For instance, some law firms in the UK reportedly defend interests of the global elites against those working to disclose corrupt practices. This was once again showcased in the recently surfaced lawsuit of four Russian billionaires against HarperCollins and a former Financial Times journalist, Catherine Belton, over a book they have published about the rise of Vladimir Putin. As corruption became a transnational phenomenon, it is essential to acknowledge that so did the actions associated with corruption. Evidently, the global nature of SLAP is not sufficiently understood. It is often underestimated. Sometimes the issue is intentionally ignored by some government, which is why it is even more important that we have supporters among the public officials and the legislators, such as the MP Chris Matheson, the UK Shadow Minister of State for Media, who had kindly joined us to chair this event, not accidentally scheduled during the week celebrating World Press Freedom Day. Mr. Matheson, the floor is yours. Afa, thank you for that um, fantastic introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. As just said, it's no coincidence that we're having this day in the week that we have World Press Freedom Day. And sometimes, understand World Press Freedom Day, we look at the most extreme, perhaps the most violent um, incidents that have had to journalists in the previous year and some of the most um, uh, authoritarian restrictions that journalists and news organizations face when they are carrying out what is an essential role in any um, in, in any uh, democratic, progressive, open society. But the issue of slaps, which is, I have confess, a fairly new one to me, is becoming um, all the more uh, pervasive and all the more worrying because it is happening within a, in, in areas that where perhaps you might think that there is less of a problem with censorship for journalists and restrictions on journalists and news. I'd like to thank the Foreign Policy Center, Index on Censorship and Justice for Journalists, uh, as Vav has just said, for bringing everybody together and for working together to put, turn the spotlight on this particularly pernicious form of what is essentially abuse. It is people or organizations with a lot of money, a lot of power, a lot of influence, turning that on individual journalists or even on newspapers that have less power, less authority, less money, and simply cannot afford to be tied up uh, in litig litigation or in legal processes and um, having to face huge legal costs um, and therefore will back away from a story. There's a more sinister side to this, of course, which we'll hear from um, uh, perhaps later on as well uh, during, the, during this course of the discussion, where it's not simply legal threats, but surveillance, monitoring, uh, and journalists being put under other forms of undue pressure, uh, all short perhaps of direct violence. But nevertheless, all the aims are the same, which are to discourage, intimidate, bully 
uh, the correct chasing of, uh, of news and of a story. We've got a fantastic panel um, this afternoon. We've got Susan Coftry, who is the project director at the Foreign Policy Centre. Franz Wild is the editor and reporter at the Bureau of Investigative Journalism. Jill Phillips is the director of editorial legal services at Guardian News and Media. And Jessica Nivanin is the policy and campaigns manager of Index on Censorship. We're going to be hearing from all four, uh, four of those, um, as well as gain perhaps from um, Vafra later on as well, but all four of them will make um, a contribution, first of all. And then obviously the floor will be open to all um, uh, participants. If I could ask you if you would use the Q&A function to ask your questions, then I will try and pull some of those out and try and um, uh, address them to one or more of the panelists. That would be great. But let's go straight on, first of all, um, to our first um, panelist uh, contribution. So Susan from the Foreign Policy, Policy Centre, over to you. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, I just want to explain our entry point into, into this topic. Uh, since last July, I have been with FPC heading up a project called Unsafe for Scrutiny, which looks at threats and violations against investigative journalists who uh, report on financial crime and corruption, particularly where there is a link with UK, or they've been somehow facilitated by UK financial or legal systems. I mean, part of the inspiration for the project with journalists like the Azerbaijani independent journalist, Khadija Ismailova, whose reporting contributed to OCCRP's investigation, the Azerbaijani laundromat, which, for example, identified four shell companies based in the UK that were being used to effectively launder money from Azerbaijan's political and business elites. Um, we wanted to understand better what were the scope and scale of, sort of various threats that were facing investigative journalists. And in order to do that, we started by conducting a survey, a global survey, and we had responses from 63 investigative journalists working on financial crime and corruption in 41 countries. 71% experienced threats um, of any kind of nature. Um, unsurprisingly, probably the most common would be sort of online harassment, trolling, written threats, smear campaigns. But 73% of respondents who experienced any kind of threat had been subject to legal threats. And moreover, that those legal threats had been um, that they identified those as being um, having the most impact on their ability to continue working. So even if they had been subject to sort of smear campaigns or even physical attack, it was the legal threats that were of the highest concern in order co to continue their work. And the most shocking amongst that was that the UK was identified as the leading international source of those threats, more than EU countries and the US combined. So that figure really pointed us at A, the importance of the issue of legal threats, and B, as the, U as the UK, as a very important forum um, that was facilitating not only the money laundering aspect, but then also the, the space to um, try to suppress information about um, stories that were trying to uncover those wrongdoings. Um, to follow up on, on that survey, we produced a report examining cases of violations, including legal challenges. Um, some of the cases that we highlighted, this was a report we produced in December called Unsafe for Scrutiny, was that of Paul Radu, who is the co-founder of OCCRP. He's a Romanian journalist, but he was taken to court in London by a sitting Azerbaijani MP who had been named um, in the reporting by OCCRP on the Azerbaijani laundromat. And that court case lasted almost two years before on the eve of the trial, which was to take place last January, um, the claimant, the Azerbaijani MP, decided to drop the case and a settlement was, was agreed where the article stayed online, albeit with a disclaimer saying that the person in question disagreed with the, with the information that was published. Now, you could see that as a, as a positive result, the information was still online, still accessible, but the amount of time and particularly financial resources that took for a two year case for an investigative outlet um, that while doing amazing work is not huge, um, is, is incredible and very damaging. And the sad thing is that's not an isolated case. Other cases that we featured in the report 
included that of Claire Rucastle Brown, who's a British journalist, but um, investigated and, and was crucial in uncovering uh, the 1MDB scandal, which related to the Malaysian Sovereign Wealth Fund, where Malaysian political elite, including the former prime minister, um, was effectively stealing from, from, from the money that was for the, the good of the people. And um, she was also pursued, amongst many other things, through the UK court system. Again, um, that case lasted for almost two years before being settled, um, but at great personal and financial cost. Um, and it wasn't the only thing that happened to her, uh, unfortunately. She was subject to various other smear campaigns and online harassment, which came alongside the legal threats. And this is something we've also seen. Um, one of the journalists who works for the Financial Times, Dan McCrum, who is instrumental in uncovering the Wirecard um, scandal, which um, is, well, Wirecard is a German fintech firm. Um, and what in what's been described as the largest accounting fraud scandal since Enron. So it's a pretty big story he was working on for a number of years. And I just want to read uh, just briefly what um, Dan McCrum wrote himself. He, he said he was subject to the furious online abuse, hacking, electronic eavesdropping, physical surveillance, and some of London's most expensive lawyers. He noted that while observers of the Wirecard affair have tended to criticize the German establishment the fact this fraud ran for 20 years unchecked. Yet almost the external, all the, sorry, yet almost all the external professionals hired by the company to protect its reputation were based in London. And that of course includes the lawyers. So the question is why does the UK, especially London, remain an attractive jurisdiction for legal threats? Um, and actually there's a number of reasons, one of them being the burden of proof lies with the defendant and they have to defend the legal meaning of what a judge decides to be what they published. So Paul Radu spoke to this point when writing about his own case, which is journalists present facts and they allow their readers to draw their conclusions. But sometimes when fighting a legal case, um, what the judge decide is, decides is the legal meaning isn't necessarily what the journalists set out to say in the first place. Um, and then of course the cost and the expense of litigation. I mean, the cases that I've mentioned that went to the high court ended up lasting you know, two years and thousands, hundreds of thousands sometimes in expense. And while um, you know, very glad that people like Paul and Claire and others um, fight these cases, that's incredibly intimidating and not you know, feasible for all journalists to be able to have the resources to push back against those kind of threats. And in those cases in particular, you can apparently see what would have been the loss, the loss of information um, that has come to light that allows people to then being held account for, for their wrongdoing. I mean, in Claire's case with the 1MDB scandal, the um, former prime minister is now in jail and um, uh, the, one of the other masterminds on the run from, from three jurisdictions. So, you know, the work of investigative journalists is incredibly important and the threat of legal action is a huge concern, not just against them personally and the impact it has on them, the fear of losing, you know, their home, their money, their pensions, their ability to continue working, but also the ripple effect it has on society. Um, and while we know about some of these cases that I've mentioned, I think what the research that we've been doing this year has really pointed to is that it's the tip of the iceberg. There's a considerable hidden problem because if journalists do, and sometimes quite understandably in the face of significant legal threat, or if there's a number of threats they're dealing with at one time, it's not possible to fight them all. Um, they may fault and therefore whatever the information or amend their, their articles accordingly. Um, and it may not be possible to then know, you know what the investigative journalist is writing about, nor even that a legal threat took place. Um, so ultimately it sort of creates a vacuum of information. And if we go back to talking about corruption, that can be really damaging for systems like due diligence systems that try to pick up um, information about people that uh, might be politically exposed, for example, or even law enforcement who often rely on information that inv 
investigative journalists have brought forward um, in order to bring people to account. So um, that's sort of where we are at the moment in terms of documenting uh, our, um, our research and trying to find cases um, and trying to kind of throw a spotlight on this hidden problem and trying to find ways that that can be recorded. I mean, one of the things that we've noted is that um, journalists that we speak to don't often always talk about this. So we're very glad <laughs> that there are increasingly opportunities and that journalists, you know, including brands and of course, you know, um, Jill as an as a in-house legal counsel are here willing to talk about this issue. Um, but, you know, we're also exploring what are other ways to highlight this for, you know, putting um, reports into regulatory bodies like the Solicitor Regulatory Authority, for example, uh, who might be able to take up more of this issue moving forward. So um, hopefully that's just given an outline of, of the issue and I'm personally very keen to also hear from Franz and, and Jill as to their, their perspective on this matter. Susan, thank you very much. And it does strike me that if journalists aren't willing, understandably, to talk about threats that they've received um, and don't have the, always have the outlets that you and the, out, the old fellow organisations today are giving them, then actually we don't know the scale of the problem um, because um, we have no idea how many have been threatened and intimidated and had to drop investigations as a result. And that in itself is very worrying. Let's go to Franz. Um, Franz is the editor and the reporter at the Bureau of Investigative Journalism. Franz, over to you. Uh, thanks, Chris. Just to clarify, I'm not the editor uh, at the Bureau. I'm one of the editors. So <laughs> I've, got a I've got a few more steps to go till I reach the top. Um, yeah, so I've, I've been an investigative journalist for about uh, 10 years or so, I'd say, and in, in various countries. Um, and I just want to give you a little bit of an overview of, of the ev evolution of this. Um, about 10 years ago or eight years ago, you would have um, uncovered some alleged allegations against a public official or a corrupt businessman or whatever it might be. And you might um, approach them, send them some questions, possibly go to their spokesperson, and that is how you would engage. Um, now, what almost always happens, and, and this is really, really stark, in the last five years, you almost always get a letter from a lawyer specifically. And that, that, law, that letter is usually marked confidential, not for publication. And it, it very often, I mean, I won't say everyone, but it is happening a lot now, it is, it is designed essentially to shift the conversation from something that is happening out in the open in a transparent fashion to um, a sort of confidential behind the scenes undermining of a particular story or a narrative. Um, I mean, just as a way, uh, just by way of example, this is not a story I worked on myself, but the Bureau recently uh, wrote an article um, about an organization and they paid, we know, a hundred thousand pounds towards lawyers to try and stop the story. And th this is vexatious in the sense that th there is no intention to answer any of the questions. Obviously that there are different forms of journalism. Some of it isn't in the public interest. So I want to limit myself to um, what is in the public interest, Wirecard very clearly, uh, the 1MDB scandal very clearly. Uh, there are plenty of examples, and I'd say most of the people affected here are uh, journalists working in the public interest. Um, the, the effect is uh, that, that every time you deal with uh, this kind of a letter, you slow down and you have to um, address all of these points. Um, and, you know, for smaller newsrooms, often that's not possible. For lo local newsrooms, that's not possible. We know that there is a funding crisis in journalism. I mean, at the Bureau, we're, we're very lucky because we're specifically set up for investigative journalism. So we're set up, we have the legal resources and we have the time to deal with these things. So it's, it's not going to put us off. And I like to, th and, and I think the big media houses um, are all set up in that way, but it is absolutely essential, um, you know, that we, uh, th that all the media houses kind of assist their journalists in this way. 
Um, I mean, it's a question of training and it's a, it's a question of legal resource. Um, uh, secondly, it's obviously really, really important that something happens, that there is some sort of code of ethics that is implemented, um, which prevents lawyers um, from, from actually doing this sort of thing. Uh, I, I wanted to, uh, I mean, ob obviously the, the, the effect on society is incredibly damaging because you know, any one story that is held up by this is um, is one story less that's out there. And, you know, potentially you, you, you have a dangerous person on the loose and we're not able to get information out about them. Um, you know, the, the risks are sort of self-evident. Um, and the balance of power is essentially tipped from um, a, a level playing field and environment of transparency to something where the uh, the rich and powerful are always in control um, and, and are able to uh, quash stories. And this really is a question of money because um, if you can hire the finest lawyers in town, um, it's it's very easy just to keep, keep pushing and keep pushing and keep pushing. I've been in situations where I've been arguing with lawyers for over a year. Um, and yes, we got the story out in the end, and we will always get the story out if the story is valid. Um, but, but the fact that it was delayed would almost certainly have allowed the other people to gain some kind of an advantage uh, from that. I just want to relate briefly um, the, the significance of, of London and, and England here. Um, as, as Susan mentioned, um, uh, England really is at the top of the list when it comes to this uh, type of thing. Most of the stories I've worked on in my career have had um, have had elements from all sorts of different countries, and I've uh, collaborated with journalists uh, in the U.S. and South Africa, in France, uh, all over. The lawyers always come to London. This is always the place where they. Um, threaten to go after you. And th that obviously tells you a lot. And that tells you that um, as, as much as we um, as, as much as as much as we believe in you know the protection of individuals and right to privacy and that sort of thing, we really need to think about how we balance that with um, you know the, the right of journalists to hold uh, powerful people uh, to account. I just want to leave you um, briefly with, with one an anecdote. Um, this is a story I, I worked on previously. Um, I'll, I'll outline it very briefly. There was um, a few whistleblowers at a, a bank um, in an African country. Um, and they shared with us um, a lot of material which revealed really egregious uh, financial wrongdoing. Um, the, we, we published the story and after the story, and I was no longer part of the process afterwards, but it's, it's, it's been reported that um, there was sort of follow-up stories happening. After the story was published and their identities were revealed, um, so this had followed a sort of campaign where they were trying to unmask the whistleblowers. Um, the, the whistleblowers were, were um, sentenced um, to death in this African country. Um, they were accused of having stolen uh, confidential information and accused of having altered it as well, which is, I mean, we've corroborated that isn't true. But the point I'm trying to make is this. Um, a British law firm then briefed journalists with, this, uh, with these allegations made in the African country um, to try and undermine these whistleblowers. So they were very deliberately um, enabling this kind of, um, this defense of uh, the, the individuals whom we'd written about. Um, and moreover, some of the documents they shared with journalists 
were actually different versions of the original documents in the that the court produced in the African country, all to show that you know there is also very little scrutiny. It's very difficult to scrutinize a law firm that tells you X, whereas we know X isn't true at all. Um, but it's very hard. But, but because they're operating under the cover of professional privilege um, and confidentiality, it's actually impossible to uh, to expose this. And so it, it creates this environment where they, they really are quite, quite free um, to operate as they please. And it's, it's incredibly de debilitating. And, you know, I like to think that most journalists, most, most uh, organizations will plow on, um, not heedlessly, they'll listen to everything, um, but they will corroborate the facts and they will, they will see it through. Um, thank you. And thank you. That's um, uh, again this picture building up of the UK and of London as being the destination of choice. And we might refer return to that later. The role of lawyers and the role of, um, of some of these legal firms um, is also being questioned at the moment as well. Um, Jill Phillips is the director of editorial and legal services for Guardian News and Media, which I guess Jill means that uh, sometimes it's down to you to make decisions on how you respond to some of these. Uh, some of these threats or some of this intimidation. Jill, over to you. Thanks, thanks very much, Chris. And thanks, Susan and Franz as well. And I'm going to apologize if you see a bits of cat, tail or head, because as is the way, she's decided that now is the moment to put in an appearance. Um, so I, I, was going to, I was going to make three or four points and I'll try and, I'll try and be brief. I, I think from, from the legal perspective, and it's really picking up on a theme that has already been raised here. Um, there have been two big legal shifts in the UK in the last five to 10 years. Um, as we know, um, you know, we've always had defamation litigation. Um, and, you know, if you go back, although we didn't call it slap back in the day, McLibel, there was a whole series of um, legal actions bought by a, a, a Waste, ref waste incinerator company in uh, Pontypool called Rechem back in the 1980s. And they sued everyone who published anything at all critical, including sort of local people who were saying, well, this stuff's landing. So, you know, we've, we've had slap around, we just haven't given it a name uh, as we are now doing. But, but it used to be the case that it was primarily focused on libel um, and, and um, that was because it took advantage of, and although the 2013 Defamation Act made some differences, it took advantages of favorable things in this regime. One, uh, again, as has been mentioned, but the costs regime for lawyers here is very favorable. Um, it, it's much more expensive to litigate and to face the cost consequences in the UK than it is in Europe, where they tend to have fixed fee regimes around what you have to pay and what you can recover. So there's that issue. There's the burden of proof issue that Susan's mentioned, which is the entire burden of proof is on the defence media to uh, put forward their defences. And the third area that we have a very technical uh, route round is, me is meaning and how meaning is defined, which is much less straightforward again than it is in some jurisdiction, some jurisdictions. So there are those sort of differences that make the UK quite attractive. Um, and then I think in the, the first really big shift has been to uh, using data protection um, rather, than, rather than defamation. And defamation, if you, can get, if you can get beyond the immediate, does have defenses available to it for journalism, obviously. Um, and, and as I say, the 2013 Act brought in some more useful ones, the serious harm threshold in particular. But what that's done is made claimant lawyers look elsewhere. Um, and one of the main areas they look at now is, is data protection. So for example, um, we saw in uh, 2017, a case called, it's a very long name, but um, it, it's a, a, a Prince of Morocco against an Arabic publishing company called Elaf. Um, which published a story in Arabic. They were based in, in London, so that was the jurisdictional link, but they published a story in Arabic about something to do with Moroccan politics uh, and were sued. And originally they were sued 
in defamation. And the court said, well, it doesn't look like there's a defamatory meaning here. At which point they said, oh, well, we'll add a, we'll add a data protection claim in as well then. And it went through the motions and basically went to the Court of Appeal and the Court of Appeal said that that's not an abusive process. You know, if you can't get your defamation claim up and running, well, use a different one, use data protection. So that sort of set the scene. And we'd already had um, in 2014 the case people may remember with um, a chap called Benny Steinmetz, who was one of a number of people running BSG resources which was a mining conglomerate in Guinea. Um, and they brought a data protection claim against Global Witness. And, and what, they, what they wanted really was just to grind Global Witness to a halt, because what they would get out of it in data protection terms and money terms was not going to be enormous. But it just, it's a very complex uh, pr process if someone uses data protection against journalism, you have to go through all your documents. So we've got this sort of trend of, um, moving away a bit from defamation and into data protection, which uh, to which really the only defense available is uh, that you thought about the public interest when you published. There's no defense of truth, for example. So truth becomes irrelevant in that, in that, in that sphere. The second thing that's happened legally that I think it has made a big difference, and France touched on this, is the deployment of Article 8 privacy rights around state investigations, and the reporting of state investigations and arrests. Um, uh, it's always been a tricky area um, for journalists to report in the UK reporting on arrests um, and investigations because there's always been a defamation uh, sort of issue lurking in the background and there's always been a contempt issue lurking in the background but increasingly now um, it's the privacy issue that, that's at stake and there's been a line of cases um, really starting from the Leveson inquiry in 2012, um, but moving through a sort of tabloid case, as, as is often the way in 2015 involving The Sun, which was heard by Mr Justice Mann, who is the judge who has done most of the phone hacking cases. So he's, he's a man who's very interested in privacy and breaches of privacy. Um, and the Sun, the Sun case from 2015 was about two tabloid stories that the Sun had got information from from people who probably shouldn't have been talking to them, but but had so pretty typical stuff. Um, and um, they, they sued over privacy, and basically the judge said, "Yeah, that's all okay. The fact that there have been leaks to the police from the police or about police matters to the tabloids." Someone, people have a reasonable expectation of privacy in those matters. And that's then come through various other cases up to date through Cliff Richard, uh, a case called ZXC and Bloomberg, which is going to the Supreme Court at the end of this year. And uh, most recently a case called Sikri and Associated. And all of that is combined just to make it much more hard for journalists to report these areas. And so it makes them more vulnerable to pre-publication injunctions. And that's where the slap threat issue really comes home to rest. Uh, it's always been quite hard to get an injunction on defamation terms, but it's quite easy in privacy terms. So deploying those things to stories, um, to journalists, particularly as France said, when they send a right to reply, and the next thing they know is they're met with a, a threat of, or even possibly an injunction, um, you know, is going to put some small publishers off forever going anywhere near the topic, even if it's true. So I think that those are the two, two big legal things that have happened, that have shifted things to make us even more attractive. Um, Franz touched on the, the right to reply issues. And uh, you know, as someone who works in house at The Guardian, we get these letters all the time. Journalists do what they're supposed to do, responsibly, ethically, send a, send a letter saying, we're going to write a story about you. We want to check our facts. We want to make sure we've got things right. And the next thing they get is a deluge from, from lawyers. Uh, and as Franz said, they've got this heading on them that says, not for publication. And the journalist's going, well, what am I supposed to do with that? I've written to you as a journalist about something I'm thinking about publishing. And you're saying, well, I'm telling you all this, but you can't publish any of it. So it's all, it's all quite confusing. And quite often it'll be headed confidential, uh, private. So, it, 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 that just doesn't help 
uh, anything at all. And the risks for the journalist, if they don't engage, if they don't send a right to reply, are that they may lose their defamation defence, they may uh, get things wrong, which is in no one's interests. So, you know, de deploying this sort of heavy handed response, um, as opposed to just trying to sort of answer the questions and make sure that the right information is, is put it over, really serves no public interest at all, I think, I think most of us would say. Um, I think that's probably enough from me in, in terms of um, the, 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 the legal issues. There are many, but um, just to give some context to how it sort of fits in the SLAP context. Thanks, Chris. Jill, thanks ever so much for that. I um, did this concept of the journal of the of the um, lawyer putting marking all of their in um, their letters as private and confidential and not for publication. Um, it, it sort of, as you say, it's a further way to tie up knots. I had one in one case against me in my time as an MP where um, a, a lawyers wrote to me and they even claimed um, uh, intellectual property rights on their letter. And suggested that it would be uh, not fit for not open for publication. Um, I froze then. I hope you didn't. You didn't get it. But they, they went through all manner to keep it private. But Jill, thank you for that. Uh, finally, um, let's go to Jessica Nivanin. Jessica is the policy and campaigns manager at Index on Censorship. Jessica, over to you. Thanks a lot, Chris. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the anti-slap work that we've been undertaking at EU level, as the EU is a little bit more ahead um, in tackling this and, and the UK definitely needs to, to follow suit. Um, so as we've heard already, one of the main characteristics of a slap is the disparity of power. It's the big guy versus the little guy, or as um, uh, EU Commissioner Vera Yarova recently put it, it's David versus Goliath. Um, and so it's really important for civil society organizations and journalists to come together and hopefully defeat slaps. And Index is therefore one of nearly 30 organizations that makes up the coalition against slaps in Europe, um, which is known as CASE. And you can find out a little bit more about the coalition's work on the website, the-case.eu. But CASE's aims are basically threefold. Um, to expose slaps and those that use them, to build resilience against slaps and to advocate for legal reform. So I'm going to speak briefly about indexes and cases work in each of these areas. And of course, it's important to mention as well that although we're talking about journalists in the media this afternoon, it's not only journalists that are affected by slaps, it's any public watchdogs, including academic civil society organizations as well that can be affected. Um, so firstly, exposing or documenting slaps is vital for us as civil society organisations um, in order to be able to convince policymakers to enact suitable reforms. But as has already been mentioned by Franz and Jill, um, this can be made quite difficult by the fact that these letters are often, if not usually, marked private and confidential, not for publication. Um, and so journalists who would I think quite understandably prefer to save themselves all the stress and the hassle would um, just quietly succumb to the demands of the would-be litigant uh, rather than you know attract this time, very time consuming and, and costly um, process on themselves. So um, this is why it's very difficult to ascertain how widespread this issue is. We tend to hear about slaps mostly from those who have refused to be silenced silence too, I think it's fair to say are realistically in the minority. Um, so um, I was just going to raise two examples as well. So one of the cases that we have brought to the European Commission's attention is the lawsuit that is facing two journalists from the organization, Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, um, OCCRP. So in mid-2018, um, Italian journalist Sara Feralfi and Cypriot journalist Delios Orfanides um, published an investigation showing how offshore companies and accounts had been used to channel and launder millions of dollars that were stolen from the Libyan government. And shortly they are, thereafter, they were sued by a lawyer peripherally connected to the story and four other lawyers from the same firm. And the lawsuit was claiming damages of up to two million euro from them. So here we are nearly three years later and the case is still ongoing um, and the journalists actually don't expect it to come before the, the courts in Cyprus until at least 2025. Um, so all the while the journalists have this constant sense of unease and uncertainty hanging over them. Um, and I would quote uh, Sarah Feralfi, one of the journalists uh, who speaking about the litigants said, for them to file a lawsuit against two journalists, it just costs nothing. 
It just costs nothing. There are no downsides. They just need to do what they do every day. They don't need to allocate any special resources to it. So there is an asymmetry, a disproportion of forces. And I think that's really important because that's one of the aspects, that's one of the, the main aspects of a SLAP and it is one of the main areas that an anti-SLAP measures or legislation would need to address. Um, a second case that we have brought to both the UK authorities and the European Commission's attention is the lawsuit that has been taken against the Swedish business and finance publication Realtids, their editor-in-chief and two of their investigative journalists. Um, and although the journalists are all in Sweden, um, although they're publishing in Swedish and for a Swedish readership, the lawsuit is being taken in London. Um, the journalist team, the journalist legal team have made um, a jurisdiction challenge, um, but we're currently awaiting the judgment on that. So for now, the journalists are still facing a costly time and energy consuming legal battle. And of course, the battle the battle that they are fighting is in the public interest, as has been said already. This is not something that they personally have anything to gain from. They have everything to lose and nothing to gain. So this is as well one of the really chilling aspects of slaps, um, because basically if they lose, they could personally be facing bankruptcy. Um, and so this is why, again, any anti-slap measures, uh, well, anti-slap measures, first of all, are really desperately needed. Um, in order to, to provide protection to public watchdogs who are vulnerable to this kind of legal harassment. Um, so uh, then to move on to the second um, kind of uh, aim of CASE, um, the CASE coalition is um, building resilience to SLAPs. So um, we need to ensure that journalists are supported and empowered to carry out their work. Um, and we need to raise awareness around the issue of slaps. Uh, as you said, Chris, maybe this was a phenomenon before that you were previously um, you know, unacquainted with, let's say. So this is a really important aspect as well as raising awareness about this issue, because this is the only way that we can start to tackle it as well. Um, and we need to ensure that journalists know that there is support available. Um, so for instance, Index has developed a slap tool on its website, which means that um, journalists, if they feel, if they're unsure whether the, the legal threat or action that's, that's targeting them, they don't know if that could be, could constitute a slap, they can use the tool. Um, and also on the case website, there is an overview of the lawyers, law firms and legal organizations there as well, um, including in the UK that are able to support slap victims on a pro bono or reduced fee basis. So, so I think that's that will be useful as well very often. Um, and finally, and perhaps most importantly, um, the need, there is a huge need to advocate for legal reform in this area. Um, so the resources, um, yeah, the resources are very important, but legal reform will be the most important means by which to stop slaps. So, and, and, you know, it's not, it wouldn't be something um, without precedent. Anti-SLAP legislation has already been, enact, been enacted in around 30 states in the US and in Canada since the early 1990s. Um, and last December, the European Commission announced that it would present an anti-SLAPs initiative by the end of 2021. Um, and we, as, as civil society organizations who are working in this area, we're calling specifically for legislation and, and a directive in particular that would include several remedial measures, such as um, for slap claims, to, slap claims to be dismissed at an early stage to avoid them from dragging on for years and thereby, thereby minimizing their harmful effects. And also for anyone found to have brought a slap to be sanctioned, because that as, as I, when I quoted Sarah Farolfi previously, that's one of the, the the real um, issues that leads to the disparity of power as well, that the litigants have really nothing to lose by taking this kind of case. Um, and the you can read the, the proposal in full from this coalition, um, the case coalition on the on the website. It was put forward last year. Um, the, there's a mod, actually a model anti-slap directive there, which, which might be of interest to some people here. Um, and so, yes, the EU or the UK definitely needs to follow suit in this regard. We know from research that has been carried out um, by foreign policy, as Susan mentioned, that investigative journalists around the world are receiving letters from London law, um, law and PR firms. Um, so the UK, and, and of course, it's, it's worth noting as well that, of course, the UK is at the moment undertaking a global media freedom campaign. But at the same time, they're basically harboring an industry that profits from the intimidation of journalists and the suppression of information. 
So we need to see more engagement from the UK authorities on this issue. Um, earlier this year, of course, the National Action Plan was launched um, and it, it aimed to ensure that journalists operating in the UK are as safe as possible and that they're able to do their job without threats or attacks. Um, and as it stands, slaps are currently not addressed in the plan, but it is a living document. Um, and I know that several organizations would like to, including Index, would like to see slaps addressed in, in the plan. Um, because as evident from Susan's point earlier, slaps are often inherently linked to other forms of threats um, and surveillance. So just to, to briefly um, sum up um, or, or to make a final kind of uh, point on this, which I think is really important, um, it's not slaps, it's not journalists who exclusively suffer from slaps. Um, this is something that affects us all as, as you know, people who read the media, as people who are informed, who intend to vote, as many people will be doing this week as we spoke before coming on, on tonight or this afternoon. Um, so I think it's really important that we need to, to make sure the journalists can hold power to account, because if they're being prevented from doing so, really our human rights, our rule of law and our democracy are, are all in peril. Um, thank you. Ethica, thank you. That was fantastic. And what you did there, as, as well as identifying the problem, you were giving us some suggestions of the work that you've already done in terms of solutions, in terms of the way forward to um, uh, tackle this problem, certainly in the UK, but internationally as well. And I thought that was really, um, really helpful. So um, I'm going to in invite um, members of the audience to uh, submit questions again via the Q&A box. The gold star today there was my old friend, Lord Cromwell, Godfrey Cromwell. Godfrey's put um, several um, uh, points in. And so um, let, let me just, let me just um, dip into that one first of all, while I invite others to perhaps um, contribute to the chat. Um, Godfrey says, how can we get more coverage of this as a topic in itself? Intimidation to prevent exposure and freedom of expression in the mainstream media. In other words, it, often it's, it is journalists that are being um, that are being affected. It is news outlets that are being affected, um, but they're not able to talk about the generalities um, of the problem, even if the specifics of a particular case they're prevented from talking about. It sounds like there are plenty, Godfrey goes on to say, it sounds like there are plenty of good stories out there. We may not be able to give examples, which will take some power out of it, but reasons why, um, but reasons why we, cannot, we cannot give examples is it could be covered by a third party rather than the journalist who's intimidated. So why can't we give examples? The, the fact that we can't give examples is the story to some extent, says Godfrey. Big organizations lawyering, lawyering up to overpower small ones is a familiar theme. Um, would somebody like to, come to tackle that? It's a, it's a fair point that Godfrey's making. Jill? Um, yeah, it is a fair point. And, you know, I think it's sort of, it's partly um, journalists always have a reluctance to write stories about themselves. Um, and it, it, it's sort of trying to move them on from that view to say, well, sometimes you are the story and you're entitled to write about it. The second point that comes out of that is that the part of the difficulty, not so much, I think, as, as, as you've said, Chris, for, for the, you know, the mainstream media who are, you know, we do have the resources and we do have lawyers and we, are, you know, we look at these things and we can take some time and, and, and take some hits on it. But if, if you're being threatened with, you know, what look like very serious legal and costs and time consequences, it, writing, about this, writing about that can of itself be quite tricky for you. I mean, people just get, get silenced by the fear of the whole thing and then they go, well, I can't. How can I write about this? Because people might work out um, about who it is. And I, I think the third thing that feeds into that is that, as you said, you know, the trouble with writing stories that don't have specific examples and names in them is that they're not always as interesting to the public as stories that are about actual businesses. And that's the full circle, because if you can't write about them because you're being threatened, because you might be sued, then you sort of get into a, into a vicious a vicious circle uh, of not publishing, um, and then you know feeding in what Franz said and others have said about the right to replies coming in telling you well you can't publish any of this either, um, and it, it it's all a 
you know, very tricky landscape that's left for people to, to, to try to navigate. Yes. Um, does anybody want to come in on that? Susan? Hi, yeah. I mean, some of the cases that we, we do know um, of sort of potential SNAP attempts against media, um, we know about them because the journalists have published about the fact that that's happened and some of them have taken the step where they've obviously felt legally able to of publishing the letter or at least, you know, publishing that there was a was a threat. Um, that is part of the sort of wider story um, of, of whatever happened, but also the fact that there was this attempt to suppress. Those cases aren't, um, you know, there's a few is what I would say. Um, and it's incredibly, you know, brave journalists who, who, who do that because um, I think there is a lot of fear that by doing things like that, it would potentially invoke further legal action, you know, and if something's died down and you have managed to publish the story, uh, you may not be inclined to, um, you know, sort of reopen it by then going, mm -hmm. you know, this has happened. And of course, you know, law firms themselves are not wanting to be um, classified as slap enablers and likely to take objection to that. So, you know, there's, there's sort of layers of, of, of concern. Um, and, but I would say um, on a sort of positive side that, um, <laughs> I do think that because this issue has come to prominence, um, and actually I would, we've, we've not mentioned it yet, but I think it was really, at least in Europe, a lot of the work stemmed from the murder of, of Daphne Caruana Galicia, yeah. who at the time of her death had upwards of 40 cases open against her, including one from a UK, you know, from UK law firm. And um, I think that that really kind of kickstarted a lot of the, the European, work that um, that Jessica has, has mentioned and awareness has just has built and built and I think that that does encourage people to come forward and talk about it because I think there is an element of shame um, understandably yeah. journalists don't you know they want to publish the story um, and if they've you know faced these challenges and for whatever reason and understandably decided to to sort of fold um, or concede certain points then um, you know, the first instinct isn't then to go and tell everyone about it. So um, I think by hopefully some of the work that, you know, Index ourselves and others um, are doing, it gives, uh, as not journalists, I think perhaps, gives that platform and space and, and hopefully there would be more um, evidencing coming forward um, of the issue that would push for some of the changes that we'd like to see here in the UK, which of course will fall out of, um, anything that's happening at an EU level. Thank you. Anybody, one of the other colleagues want to, Franz? Yeah, just, just briefly. I mean, I, I also um, definitely sort of think that one of the reasons journalists don't, um, you know, write about this stuff per se is they don't, yeah, they don't really want to be the story necessarily. I mean, lots of journalists love to be the story, but, you know, in, in this sense, you know, we, we what we want to write about is the the sort of original allegation or the, the stuff we're trying to uncover, and and this is kind of a distraction. Then, I mean, I personally, I mean, sort of, I actually think it's it's probably a good thing to, you know, someone's trying to uh, inhibit what you're saying, or what you want to say, um, then that's that can be that can become part of the story, and I know that does occasionally happen, but it is. Um, yeah, I, th I think there's, I don't know if it's humility, but it's, you know, it's kind of a, a desire to focus on, on the sort of bigger story. And often, you know, often the, the real allegations are much, much more important and much, much bigger than, um, you know, the fact that we're getting, you know, these, these lawsuits or, sorry, threats, um, e even if that prevents the story from, from coming out. Yeah, so... We've got, um, I'll, I'll bring two questions in together. One again is from Lord Cromwell, who um, says, can a journalist report their findings and say, I have asked X for their side of the story, but their reaction was to have their lawyer send me a threatening letter saying I can't reveal anything that you may say. Um, and then you, 
the journalist can ask whether they've got something to hide and the reader should decide. Claire Rucastle, who I think has already had a mention for some of her work um, in this seminar today. Claire, welcome. Um, says, if you did not solicit a confidence or agree to be taken into someone's confidence, why should you be forced to keep such a confidence? I have published such letters in the past and got away with it, but was I in legal jeopardy for doing so? Um, Jill, could I perhaps ask you to open with that one, please? Yes, yeah, I mean, um, I think Claire's right. Uh, you have to take an informed view. And I mean, we, we spend a lot of time going backwards and forwards with the lawyers saying, we don't consider ourselves to be bound by your unilateral labeling of, of uh, what this is. This was a journalistic inquiry. And um, you know, we then get into twos and fro's, but we then say, we've, we've referred your letter to our journalist to whom it's a response to. And they go, in one case, we have one that said, you can't do that. We've written to you. And I said, they're my client. I can, you know, you saying I can't send your letter to my client. So you can see how they sort of, they, they get with these things. And, um, but you know, will they sue you? I think there was a famous, there was a famous case. It'll be more than a few years ago now because I'm, I'm, I'm far too old to, uh, to be talking current about everything. But there was a famous case where Carter Ruck, I think it was sent a letter to Private Eye, which said not for publication. And, and um, Carter Ruck then uh, published the whole letter sorry, that Private Eye published the whole letter, much to Carter Ruck's chagrin, which I think in part is why they now say at the top, not for publication, confidential. I mean, will, will they really sue you over it? You, you'd think not, they'd be bonkers to sue you for a breach of confidence over something like that. But in terms of the threat and the chilling effect it has, uh, it, it does, you know, you, you sort of go, well, what am I allowed to do? What can I say? Um, and uh, you know, going going back to the second or the first part of the question, which was around sort of what you might be able to write. The, the trouble is, because of the way, our, and we said this, it touched on this at the beginning, the way our law looks at meaning. If you write a story that sort of in, implicitly suggests that there's some wrongdoing here because of the very nature of that exchange, you're starting to get yourself sucked into a potential defamation route by that route. So you've got to be quite careful about what you then say. And I mean, I was, I was just thinking about that when we first started publishing some stories about SLAP on the back of, the, uh, of Daphne's murder and the foundation's work, um, we, you know, you had to be quite careful because if you started writing that this suit or that suit was a, was a SLAP suit, people were then going to sue you for saying that it had no basis and you get yourself caught up in the same mess again. So, you know, these things are all quite tricky judgment calls. Um, and, and again, you know, if you're resourced, you can probably find a way through them, hopefully safely without then being sued. But for, for smaller organizations, uh, that's all quite daunting and time consuming. Mm. And it strikes me as well that um, the City of London, I hope this isn't too provocative a point, but the City of London is already a place where a large amount of power resides and that it would be very difficult to overcome that um, uh, by telling some of the biggest law firms in the country that they're not, they can't take on cases or the, their ability to take on cases from very rich and very powerful clients um, is, going to be, is going to be restricted um, because that again, that might affect um, their ability to do business with some of their big money rolling clients. So, uh, you know, it would be a difficult battle to get into, um, not to say it's the right battle. We've got, while we're on the subject of lawyers, we've got a couple of questions um, about the role um, of legal firms and lawyers in undertaking these um, the, the slaps. Um, Rasa Sitamparan says, what makes slaps so easy to apply? in a cross-border case, e.g. from London to an African nation. Are local lawyers involved in enabling this? Um, does anybody, does anybody able to um, address that one? Susan, thank you. Yes, um, no, it's not usually local lawyers who are involved. It's normally London law firms. Um, when you see uh, sort of, legal threats um, towards journalists in other locations. I mean, what happens is that there's a, 
because of the way that the UK system, legal system is set up, that if you can establish a reputation in the UK to defend, um, then that's, you know, how you can make the UK the jurisdiction. Um, and so that's where there's a very interesting link with some of the the other angle, I would say, of, of our project, which looks at financial crime and corruption and the UK as an enabler or facilitator um, through its ability to allow people to launder money here, whether that's through shell companies um, or through um, buying property with illicit funds. And so having some reputation like that uh, would then allow you to, 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 to build a case to justify that you have a reputation here to defend. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I, I, I think that that's actually quite a concerning part is that there's this sort of duality to it in the UK. It's open in both angles. And, and that that explains then why um, uh, this beef between the Romanian journalist and an Azerbaijani MP gets heard in London, but it throws open all manner of other issues about um, some of the problems that we might be seeing that the city is able to facilitate, which is quite concerning. Um, and then a second one in terms of um, uh, legal cases is from Rupert, it's Rupert Cowper Coles, and Rupert says. English solicitors are already under a regulatory obligation to act with integrity and not in a way which brings the reputation um, into, dis into disrepute. Do you think that the SRA, the Solicitor's Re uh, Re Regulation Authority, should be, or are they already investigating law firms which repeatedly threaten or bring abusive lit lit litigation? It took the Me Too movement and the Harvey Weinstein scandal to bring to light abusive non-disclosure agreements and for the SRA to monitor the position seriously. Do we need a similar watershed with slaps? Rupert, that's a great question. Thank you. Who wants to take it? I'll go first and then I think Susan, Susan yep, may thank you. pick up on it. But I mean, yes, absolutely. Again, I think it's, you know, it's about a, it's about thinking about this is relatively new. We're sort of catching up with what we might do about it. And one of the routes that has been being discussed is the SRA. It, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite tricky and Susan has looked into it a bit more um, in a bit more detail, but obviously the SRA need evidence to act. And I mean, they have acted. They acted um, against that sort of abuse of copyright threats where people were being sent, you know, what were abusive abusive threats and they sort of close that down so what they need is evidence and that that's partly again about people collating the evidence which is what people like Susan and Jessica are now offering to do and able to do so you can bring that together then it's the, then it's the language thing and the point that we've already discussed about if you don't know that this is a possible problem why would you you know you just get on with it um, so publicity about it, making people aware about it is all is all really important. And then, you know, yeah, I think that the SRA probably would uh, have a look at it. But Susan, I'll pass over to you on that that aspect of it. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I think that's that's key, really, is that in order to be able to to act, um, you need evidence and certainly when it comes to non-disclosure agreements, the SRA, if, I think it was in 2018, produced a warning notice specific on it, specifically on NDAs um, as a result of um, complaints. So they, they had a body of evidence. They obviously also had the public awareness because of Me Too. And um, so I think it's sort of two-handed really. Um, and I do sense that there is a growing awareness um, of the issue, which is good. And then also that perhaps, you know, as I was mentioning in the beginning, encouraging journalists when they receive letters. And I know it's not always at the forefront of their mind, <laughs> but if they think that that is the potential for these letters to be vexatious, to file a um, a complaint with the SRA. I mean, a, a alone one complaint may not mean anything um, and I think that's quite key because I think the SRA is also looking for patterns of behavior um, uh, but if they're able to get a series of complaints um, and, and, and covering you know different law firms different areas that they could build a picture that might push them towards addressing this issue in a similar manner and it doesn't mean that NDAs are completely not used it's just that there's guidance on how they should be used appropriately 
um, and that certain things should not be done in the process of, of deploying them. Um, and I, I think it's very interesting because, you know, the stuff around Me Too is still happening. I mean, only last week we had um, a story here in the UK uh, around uh, a British actor and um, it was reported that, you know, the journalists who were trying to uncover that and published about it received legal threats. Um, so, you know, these topics are why they aren't just about um, political corruption um, or financial uh, corruption. It, it's about every aspect of you know, life, so. Franz, did you want to come in? Yeah, I also wanted to just um, point out that I think the, um, the obligations under uh, the SRA are very general. And, and broad. And I think there are some very specific uh, behaviors which are taking place, which are often quite hard to clearly push into the category of the, the you know, these lawyers are, act, are not acting um, with integrity. So for example, if your client comes at you and says, well, do everything you can to stop this story, or I instruct you to do this, the, the solicitor will say, well, my, instru my client instructed me to do that, to say this. Um, I, I have to, you know, do what my client says. Obviously there are rules, but in, with this sort of thing, there aren't any specific rules. So I do think very specific rules um, could be incredibly useful. Um, I also think that there is, there's a real problem of truth um, so there is absolutely no interrogation of the truth uh, of what many solicitors put in their message in their in their letters, and because they're confidential, it never comes out. It doesn't really matter. Um, if 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 there was a real mechanism for challenging um, this, and that there were a real onus for the solicitors to do real due diligence on the information that they're always getting from their clients. Remember that the clients are usually, if we're writing about them, it means they usually have something to hide. I've written about a number of people who have a very long track record of, of you know, blatantly lying. And this has been shown in, in court and other places. Um, you know, if, if, if the solicitors are taking information from these people and then passing it on to the, um, the journalist under the guise of confidentiality and privacy, um, you know, they're, they're basically, you know, furthering disinformation, misinformation. They should have a real responsibility here. And I don't think that at the moment they necessarily explicitly do. Um, so that's something I, I think uh, could very much, very much help. Just very briefly, I also think, I mean, I know a lot of people a lot of journalists do not report these sorts of things um, to the SRA, and obviously we all should. Um, I, there is a perception, unfortunately, that this does not get followed up on. And, you know, I, I hope that's unfair towards the SRA, um, but un, un, I, I know too little about specifically what they've investigated and what they haven't investigated, but that is currently the perception. Franz, thank you. I've got two questions, two points that have been made about the role of Parliament. We've talked about the role of the legal firms and, 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 and lawyers and the legal system. Um, I want to just raise these two from Parliament again. One's from Lord Cromwell, who um, is suggesting that an MP needs to raise suitable questions or several in Parliament and get journalists to cover it. I could say, my Lord, that somebody could do it down the other end in the House of Lords as well. Um, but um, we'll talk about that when, when I see you again soon, God, uh, Godfrey. But again, the role of the MP. And then Peter talks about um, using parliamentary privilege as a way of exposing this. I know, for example, in some of the Me Too cases that was um, done, it does get frowned upon by the Speaker. But um, is there a role for, uh, not just for Parliament, but for individual MPs and peers in perhaps exposing some of these cases and some of these abuses? Any any takers there, Jill? I'll come in. I mean, yes is the short answer to that. 
you know, over time, it, it's it's been a very powerful way of holding people to account. Um, and the advantage, as I understand it, for the for this person speaking in the in Parliament is that they are protected because of the Bill of Rights going back a long way. And the advantage for journalists is that if they fairly and accurately report what is said in Parliament, they have a, an absolute privilege as well, at least in terms of defamation. I mean, there are sometimes tricky issues, as we know from other cases, if there's an injunction or a court order lurking in the background. But in most of these cases, there isn't. That isn't a, a, a problem. And it, it does get over the sort of some of the evidential burden um, that we've been talking about and some of the, you know, the chilling effects. Um, but, you know, obviously an MP and France touched on this as well. If you're going to say something in Parliament, you're, you're also going to want to make sure that you're right and that what you're saying is correct. So, you know, you've, there's, there's, a, there's a level of braveness for the MP as well in, um, in making those sort of statements. But in the right case, absolutely. And, you know, I think in the widest, the widest sphere, not just a specific case, but but raising the issue more generally of slaps in discussions about corruption and and how that is dealt with and how it's reported on is is all very important and i mean we saw that again jessica will speak to this probably but the, the, the um the, the the movement that has been achieved in europe has come in part through the european uh, parliament and meps being willing to engage with it and sponsor sponsor sessions around it um, in, in, in the Brussels Parliament so that there could be a free discussion. And I think you know, having an MP at your shoulder also makes people feel braver about speaking out uh, about the specific cases as well as the general problem. Jessica. Yeah, absolutely. I can pick up on that as well and say that that's um, Jill is absolutely right. That has been the case um, with some MEPs in um, in Brussels that they have essentially written in some cases to slap litigants directly to them, basically saying we're watching you, which is really it's a huge kind of vote of of support for the journalists. You know, um, they feel one of the things that slap is essentially designed to do is to to divide and conquer. You know, to isolate the journalist. Um, and so um, something like that can be really, really powerful in helping them. And, and at the moment, yes, the European Parliament is putting together the own initiative report, the INI report, which is expected hopefully sometime in the summer um, before the European Commission then eventually hopefully uh, puts forward their proposal um, before the end of the year. So, so it does have an impact. Um, and it's, it's also an awareness raising exercise, as we said as well, which is really important on this. Brilliant. Well, thanks to everybody who has, who has tabled um, questions today. And I hope we've got through uh, most of those. Um, I just wonder before we close whether any of the panel, you've all you know, had a good crap, but if there's any further points that you would like to make or um, that you'd like to, um, uh, to finish with. I'll, I'll start very briefly, Chris. You've already touched on some of it, which is solutions and things that we can do to raise awareness um, and uh, just get this more into public notice so that people start filing evidence and compiling a proper uh, set of a you know set of set of set of um, abuses. But I think another thing, which again we touched on um, briefly, uh, and Jessica mentioned it in terms of the um, the draft directive that has been put out by Case. But I think there are some procedural safeguards that could be considered in terms of litigating in the UK, which really sort of stem from the sort of procedural safeguards that they've got in the US around this sort of case. And this all stemmed from the, the public speaking out and criticizing, that, that's where it starts from. And you know, we all know that journalists are the, the eyes and ears of the public. So they de they're deserving of this protection, but what you should have is a system that says, when there is something that you think is a slap, that is clearly public interest journalism on a matter of you know, legitimate public concern. It goes into a little side alley where there's a speedy assessment of the, of the, of the pros and cons of it. There's, there's, no, uh, there's no discovery, which is very onerous in UK. There's no full trial. 
Um, there's a speedy judgment, a speedy appeal process, and that costs are stayed or shifted so that all of those things that, that make it prohibitive are parked. If ultimately the court says, well, I think this isn't a slap, fine, it goes back into the mainstream. But having a process like that would, I think, be of enormous help. Thank you. Okay. Um, if in case in, in case nobody else wants to um, finish off, can I thank um, Jessica and Susan and Vafa and Franz and Jill for um, your contributions and your fantastic insights um, into what seems to be actually quite um, a sinister problem. We've given some uh, solutions that we can start to build on as well. I do reflect um that uh, there's a danger of a reputational damage to the uk and um, if we are becoming the destination of choice for people who want to close down journalists and people who want to close down something um uh now hang on Je susan and, and jessica are both sticking their hands up now but you've come to hear them not me so let's bring susan in and let's bring jessica in after that susan I was just going to say your point about reputational risk, I think is really valid. Um, and I, I mean, the UK, I think it was mentioned earlier, uh, set up this global media freedom campaign a couple of years ago. Uh, and it's sort of really flying the flag um, as you know, the defender of media freedom, along with you know, several other countries. Um, and I think this is a strong contradiction um, than what's happening when, when you look at this issue and the UK being seen as a preferred jurisdiction for, for transnational slaps, let alone to speak about journalists who are based here in the UK who are facing these issues. So um, it's fantastic, first of all, to have you chairing this event um, and, and hopefully taking this, this issue forward and, and, and speaking to the point that was raised earlier around um, you know, really promoting interest uh, in in Parliament and and in the public. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, just thank you, Susan. Jessica, did you want to just come in there as well? Yes, yeah, so I'll just come in very briefly, just on that point around around reputational damage to the UK. I, uh, just to flag the fact that last week the um, uh, fourteen partner organisations to the Council of Europe platform for the protection of journalism and safety of journalists, which includes Index on Censorship. Um, published their annual report and in that report it's the UK is specifically singled out um, and essentially the, it's called on to to end specifically the disruptive and harmful practice by which legal firms based in the UK send numerous vexatious, vexatious threats of legal action directed at journalists and media organizations in various countries um, and um, yeah, it specifically says as well that the UK and its legal profession will be brought into distribution into distribution in the eyes of the of the world. So I think that is something that is already already happening and already um, being uh, you know being highlighted by organisations such as the Council of Europe as well. And thank you. And I think um, Sir Susan's, you've just put the Council of Europe report link um, into the chat box there. So. Um, that's very helpful as well. That's actually quite uh, disturbing. I, it just occurred to me, but then it's obviously happening already. And I reflect on the reputation that the City of London, let's say had, let's be um, diplomatic about this, had in the past tense for perhaps being awash with money that was um, gained, um, perhaps um, not entirely 100% um, um, le legitimately at the time that some former uh, countries broke up and uh, lots of money was sloshing around, shall we say. And that did the reputational damage of the city, and did, did reputational damage of the city, um, which is still present today. I would be very concerned if the same thing starts to happen in terms of protection of lawyers, uh, protection of journalists um, from lawyers um, at a time when, as Susan says, we're trying to promote the, um, the uh, protection of journalists. Everybody knows the name of Daphne Caruana Galitza. Everybody knows the name of Lyra McKee, um, but this seems, it seems like this kind of intimidation, uh, legal, lawful uh, intimidation, if I can use those, for, those phrases, um, is going far too deep and far too fast. So a huge thank you um, to the Foreign Policy Centre, to Justice for Journalists and to Index on Censorship, not just for the participation today, not just for organising today, but for the work that you're doing and you've galvanized uh, me, certainly Lord Cromwell, who's there, there as well, um, and others 
um, to look again and redouble our efforts in this area. Thank you to everyone for attending. Thank you to everyone for your, for your participation. Carry on with the great work.